Uh, well, thank you all for having me um, come tonight to present to the Monarchitech Audubon Society. Um, tonight's presentation is on the birds that use our coasts, uh, the work that Audubon does to steward these species and how everybody can help. Um, but I always like to start my presentation by just saying a little bit about myself first. So actually, let me get start sharing my screen. I think that's actually the, the most important thing I need to do. Um, okay. Just see if I get this working right. Got okay, it. Are you guys, is it working right, yep. Dennis? Yep. Okay. Um, so a lot of people think that um, if you work for Audubon, you know, you are obsessed with birds since like, you know, you were five years old. And, and I like to just let people know that that wasn't the case, that this is something that I actually got into gradually. And it really wasn't until I was um, about 25 years old that I realized like, oh my God, I love birds and I really want to be in this field. So, but I, I do like to sort of point out just a few milestones along the way that kind of brought me to where I am today. And um, first of all, my my parents, who you can see in the, the upper right, upper left corner there, um, that's that's me with the blonde hair and my my brother next to me. Um, they were always kind of nature orientated. Um, my mom always had bird feeders in the backyard and uh, would point out birds. And this one time an indigo bunting landed in our backyard and she got so excited. Um, it was like the best bird ever. And um, my dad always pointed out hawks that we'd see on the highway. So red-tailed hawks sitting in trees along the edge of the highway. Or I grew up in Naugatuck, so passing through the Naugatuck Valley, we'd always see turkey vultures and he would point those out. So I was aware of nature um, and I, I, I attribute that to my parents. Fast forward to um, when I was a senior in college at Boston University, I um, had a degree and was getting a degree in biology with a specialization, specialization in the marine sciences. But a lot of my friends were going to, uh, you know, work in laboratories post-graduation. And I was just like, yeah, I don't know that that's for me. Um, so I felt was kind of feeling, a, a, had a moment of like, you know, career confusion. I just didn't really know where I wanted to go. But um my friend Lane, you can see in the, the bottom left picture, uh, she said, she said, hey, Corey, I, I know you kind of like birds. Do you want to go for a walk in the, the Boston um, Gardens with the Brookline Bird Club? And I was like, yeah, why not? And uh, so I went on that walk with my friend Lane and I saw this bird, a Blackburnian warbler. And it was, it was, it was just opened my eyes. Um, you know, my mom had taught me all about blue jays and cardinals and I knew what a white-throated sparrow looked like and juncos and tufted tin mice but nobody had ever told me about warblers and uh seeing this blackbirdian warbler the the race car driver of the the warbler family I I think I was just blown away I just had no clue that there were these beautiful birds um that I could see in a local park in my own backyard and um, it really just opened my eyes to the sort of diversity um, and variety of birds that you can see in North America. So fast forward again um, to 2002, I was working out in California for the Mono Lake Committee, which is a nonprofit that works to protect um, the Mono Lake, which is on the eastern side of the Sierras and its watershed. And uh, uh, someone I was working with there told me all about how they'd spent time out on the Farallon Islands studying great white sharks. And I was like, wow, that sounds so awesome. And he said, oh, I'll hook you up. And sure enough, um, I was able to go out on the Farallon Islands and um, yes, got to study great white sharks, but I also got to ban birds when I was out at the Farallon Islands. And every day we had to keep a census of the different birds that we saw. And uh, by the time I got down at the Farallon Island, that was it. I was a birder. I was converted. Um, I remember uh, meeting up with a friend right after I got off the island and we went to a restaurant and there were house sparrows at the restaurant. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't have house sparrows on my life list yet. So I, I quickly added like house sparrow to my life list. But, um, but it just really, that's the turning point where I suddenly was like, I want to study birds. That's what I want to do. I am, this is the area, the field of, of science that I really want to spend my time in. And um, not too far after that, I did go back to school and got my master's degree at Connecticut College, um, and very luckily um, got a job at Yale University studying the role of vector of uh, birds and small mammals and the vector borne tra uh, the transmission of vector borne diseases. And um, about three years later, I actually was able to get a job for the National Audubon Society as the Important Bird Area Program Coordinator for the state of Connecticut. So 
Um, uh, but that is how I got to, you know, where I am today, Director of Bird Conservation uh, for Audubon, Connecticut. It wasn't uh, something I wanted to do from when I was five onward. It's just something that gradually over the years, um, you know, I, I sort of realized this is sort of something I'm really passionate about. So, uh, well, let me also tell you a little bit about the National Audubon Society in Audubon, Connecticut. Audubon, Connecticut um, uh, actually is now sort of merged with Audubon, New York, and we are a regional office of the National Audubon Society. Um, in Connecticut, we are one of the most influential bird conservation uh, organizations in the state. Um, and through education, advocacy, uh, policy, and uh, on-the-ground conservation, we're working to protect birds and their habitats across the state. Uh, we're also a partner addressing a wide range of environmental and human health concerns. And the key word there is partner. Uh, so much of the work that we do, we could not do without partners. And um, I, I'll sort of send a, say a thank you to the Monotic Audubon Society because we have partnered with um, your Audubon chapter on many occasions from uh, improving habitat um, at Sandy Point Important Bird Area in West Haven to, uh, you know, partnering on other things. And, uh, you know, looking forward, we're going to be working together on, uh, you know, the Urban Scapes Program and um, work at Hammonasset Beach State Park. So very grateful to have a partner like Monotic Audubon Society. Uh, lastly, Audubon, Connecticut is a leader in setting the course for environmental sustainability in Connecticut. And what that basically means is uh, we do things that are good for birds, but um, as much as we can, we want that to benefit people too. Um, you know, we think if we protect birds and their habitats, that's going to lead to benefits for people as well, from, from clean water to clean air to places that one can recreate um, and just enjoy the great outdoors. Lastly, um, Audubon, Connecticut, and New York are, like I said, our regional office of the National Audubon Society. And uh, why I always think that's a good thing is that it means that the work that I'm doing in Connecticut is being replicated in New York. It's being replicated in Maryland. It's being replicated in Florida. Um, it's also being replicated across the Americas. Um, Audubon has a, a program that's really um, grown in strength in the last um, five to 10 years, which is called the Audubon Americas Program. And, uh, you know, we basically have roughly 40 staff now that are based in Central and South America. And uh, they have a new program called Conserva Aves, which um, the goals of that program are to protect 5 million acres of land um, for birds um, that um, maybe spend their summer in, in the United States, but then go and spend um, their winter down in Central and South America, but also protect the birds that are, are natural or native to those areas. And, and then also develop management plans for another 5 million acres of land um, in Central and South America. So uh, Audubon's reach isn't just across the United States. It's not just across the Northern Hemisphere. It's across the entire Western Hemisphere. And, um, you know, that just makes me excited that we are really trying to protect birds across their entire life cycles. So today's presentation is going to focus, um, you know, on our shorebirds and seabirds. I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of shorebirds and seabirds, and then we'll dive into the uh, some examples of birds uh, that use the Atlantic Flyway. Then we'll touch base on the threats to our beach nesting birds and migratory shorebirds. Uh, we'll talk about some of the ways that Audubon, Connecticut, and New York are working to, and partners are working to reduce those threats. And then we'll sort of finish up with how you can help. And this is um, a great time of year to be talking, to be raising awareness about seabirds and shorebirds because exciting news, our first three piping plover chicks hatched today um, in Connecticut. So um, this is really the peak of the nesting season. And uh, there's so much that uh, individuals can do to help these birds out uh, when they are trying to raise their young. So our seabirds and shorebirds are really pretty incredible. Um, these birds travel the globe as they go between their wintering and breeding habitats, um, often stopping to rest and refuel along the way. Seabirds and shorebirds have some of the longest migrations of all birds. And in fact, two thirds of seabirds, uh, two thirds of shorebirds breed in uh, North America up in the Arctic, and then they winter in Central and South America. So they have these huge migrations um, that they make on an annual basis. And the Arctic Tern is actually the, the winner. The Arctic Tern um, has one of the longest migrations traveling from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back annually. So um, these birds really uh, are, are incredibly amazing, the feats that they can do um, on an annual basis. 
Now, when um, our shorebirds and seabirds are migrating uh, north in the spring, it tends to be quick um, as adults are rushing to the breeding ground in hopes of getting the best territory or the best mate. While in the fall, um, migration is extended over a larger period and can include a mix of adults and also young of the year. And during these journeys, both in the spring when they're heading north and in the fall when they're heading south, uh, stopover habitats, places where birds can find abundant food resources um, from which they can sort of replenish their energy reserves are critical. Now, most people think of stopover habitat for shorebirds and seabirds as being on the coast, but that is not always the case. Um, for example, the Cheyenne Bottoms, which is located in Kansas, is a 15,000 acre uh, area of wetlands and it is uh, in the heart of the Central Flyway, and there are 39 species of shorebirds that will stop there. And for uh, 10 of those species, uh, significant populations, significant portions of their global populations stage at the Cheyenne Bottoms. So um, our migratory stopover habitat isn't just on the coast, it can definitely be inland as well. Now, to ensure that we have healthy shorebird populations in the future, um, a number of organizations got together to develop the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, which launched in 1985. Uh, this is a voluntary network of 114 sites in 18 countries that encompasses 38.6 million acres. And these sites are all managed for effective conservation, resulting in healthy shorebird populations and habitats. Um, so some of the um, sites that are along the Atlantic Flyway, so not too far away from us, include the Altamaha River Delta in Georgia, Cape Romaine in South Carolina, the Maryland and Virginia Barrier Islands, uh, Delaware Bay, the Edwin B. Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge in New Jersey, um, the Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge and Great Marsh in Massachusetts, and also the Bay of Fundy. These are places that just provide critical stopover habitat um, for our migrating shorebirds, um, both in the spring and in the fall. And they are managed to continue to be able to um, provide that very, very valuable stopover habitat. So I wanna get into um, some of the, the seabirds and shorebirds that um, we see here in Connecticut. So um, in Connecticut and in New York, um, you know, Audubon works with government agencies, Audubon chapters, land managers, and other partners um, to protect our priority shorebirds and seabirds. Um, these species include the piping plover and American oyster catcher, which you see on the left and in the center. And um, these are territorial species. So you'll see, you know, a pair and then a little further down the beach, you'll see another pair. A little further down the beach, you'll see another pair. Um, and then we also work to protect uh, species that are uh, colonial, like the least tern, the common tern, the black skimmer, um, species that congregate in really large numbers um, to, to nest on the shores of, of Connecticut or Long Island. So the piping plover um, actually uh, spends its winters in the Bahamas. And uh, I had the real uh, wonderful uh, fortune of getting to go, go to the Bahamas twice um, in my time with Audubon to uh, look at piping plover numbers um, during the winter season, uh, which was, was really cool. And uh, I'm happy to say that one of the places I got to go and um, monitor piping plovers eventually became a, a national park for the Bahamas. So I got to contribute to that, um, which was, uh, Probably one of the highlights of my career is that the work data I collected helped make um, an area, a national park for piping plovers and a variety of other um, shorebirds and other wildlife. But um, these birds start their migration up to Connecticut in March. And this year we had piping plovers. I believe it was March 7th was the first day that we had a piping plover in the state of Connecticut. So they are coming, you know, sometimes when there is still snow on the ground, not this year, but in past years, we've definitely had piping plovers uh, frolicking in the snow. And um, they're coming early because they want to get here. They want to establish their territories. They want to, um, you know, find their mate or reconnect connect with their mate from a previous year. Um, and they start nesting typically in April. Um, we get our first nests um, maybe April 20th, somewhere around there. Uh, piping plovers always lay a, a four egg nest. Might be a little variability. Sometimes you get three, sometimes you get five, but most of the time it is four. And uh, after about a month, um, those eggs will hatch. And uh, they're young, which you can sort of see the, the legs of their young in the bottom right, bottom left picture there are what's called precocial. And that means uh, from the moment that they hatch, um, they are actually able to, or, or not quite the moment that they hatch, but within a couple of hours, they can walk 
and uh, their parents will lead them to food and then they can feed themselves. Um, so they are really um, quite capable uh, just a few hours after they hatch out of their eggs. Um, I like to joke that um, wouldn't it be nice if human babies were like that? They get up and they can walk and they feed themselves just a, a few hours after being born. Um, maybe that would make uh, parenthood a lot easier. Um, anyways, but our piping plovers um, takes them about another month to get to the point that they can fledge. And uh, by that, what that means is it's when they are able to fly. And uh, Audubon, that's basically how we determine if we're, we're successful with our conservation efforts. Um, if we're able to um, provide shorebirds the protection, increase awareness about them, um, you know, and, and make sure beaches are properly managed to the point that our chicks are able to fledge, um, then it's been a successful season. So another bird that we spend a lot of time on in Connecticut is the American oyster catcher. So piping plover is um, federally threatened as well as state threatened. American oyster catcher is state threatened. A piping plover, we have, we had 66 pairs in Connecticut last year. And the Atlantic coast population is about 2,000 pairs of birds. So it's a pretty small number um, when you think about it, just 2,000 pairs of birds or 4,000 individuals. Uh, it really can, it helps you understand that why they are, are federally threatened. There just is not that many of them. Um, oyster catchers are doing a little bit better. We had 100 pairs last year. Uh, some of those pairs, um, you know, we definitely know we're breeding in Connecticut. We saw chicks, we saw nests. Um, so I think it was something like 75 were definitely breeding. Um, another 25 or so were um, what we think are young birds. So oyster catchers, um, plovers, they, you know, they, they hatch one year, the next year they're ready to be breed. Oyster catchers, it takes two or three years. And uh, one exciting thing that's happening in Connecticut right now is two oyster catcher chicks that were banded at Milford Point in 2020 are back this year. They both have mates and they both have nests. So um, one of them is at Milford Point and one of them is at Long Beach and Stratford. So, um, you know, we know that these are the same birds because we have a banding effort, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on in the presentation. But um, we have banded those birds back in 2020 um, and they came back last year. We saw them at Milford Point and they're back again this year with mates and they are they are actually doing making their first breeding attempt. So uh, it tells us that, um, you know, chicks that are. Um, now this is just sort of two two instances, so we can't really say this with too much certainty, but it's just two two instances of chicks that hatched in Connecticut, um, and then you know here three years later they are coming back to actually breed in Connecticut, very close close to the the natal site where they where they originally came from. So um, super cool information we're learning about oyster catchers from our banding efforts. But oyster catchers arrive in Connecticut roughly at the same time as the piping plovers, sometimes a few days earlier. Um, they get started nesting roughly at the same time, so middle of April. And, um, you know, we had our first oyster catcher chicks hatch last week. So um, we probably have some chicks that are about a week old at this point. And uh, one thing that's true for both piping plovers and oyster catchers, just to sort of help you guys understand the species a little bit more, is that um, if a piping plover pair or an oyster catcher pair, say they, they lay their first um, set of eggs and then a predator gets at them, or there is a coastal storm event and the eggs are washed away, um, they will try again. So, um, you know, we think of these birds as sort of arriving in March, they lay their first set of eggs in April. Um, but if say maybe three weeks into, into incubation, say the first week of May, um, their nest fails, well, about a week later, they're going to start all over again. So they will lay their eggs again. They'll start incubating again. Maybe this next nest gets to the point of the, the eggs hatch, they have chicks, and then all the chicks get eaten by an American crow. Well, they start again and they will. Um, so the breeding season for our beach nesting birds, piping plover, American oyster catcher, least turn as well. It really does stretch from April um, through the end of August. Sometimes we still have young chicks on the beach in the first few weeks of September. So it is a really long season. Um, you know, so for all the volunteers um, and technicians who help us with our beach nesting bird stewardship, um, a huge thank you because it is, it's a, a long time that these birds are trying to, to raise their young and um, all of the people out on the beaches increasing awareness about these birds, um, you know, telling people about best practices so that these birds have the chance to successfully raise their young um, is really, really important. And thank you everybody for your efforts. Um, so oyster catchers, um, they have typically weigh about three eggs. Uh, it takes about a month for them to hatch. So we had our first um, chicks hatch last week. Um, and then it will take about another month for those chicks to reach the point of being able to fly. Uh, oyster catchers are what's called semi-precocial, which means that they um, 
are, you know, they have downy feathers. They can walk a few hours after they hatch out of their eggs, um, but they really do rely on their parents to feed them. Um, you can sort of see in the bottom right picture that um, the adult oyster catcher has this big red bill um, versus the young oyster catcher that's in the picture has a much shorter bill. And uh, when these chicks first hatch, they have a very short bill. It does actually take um, two to three months for the, the bill to reach full size. And then the chicks actually have to learn how to use their bill um, to forage on various shellfish. And um, there's actually two ways that oyster catchers will forage on shellfish. Um, and they learn a technique from their parents. Some of them are, are hammerers. So they will hammer on a shell until they, they break it open and then they can, they can eat the insides. And some of them are stabbers. And what they'll do is they'll sneak up on an oyster or a mussel and they'll stick their bill in there and they'll cut the abductor muscle and then the shell just pops open and they can eat it that way too. Um, but the young oyster catchers have to actually learn this technique from their parents. Um, so oyster catcher chicks um, will actually, even after they fledge, will stay with their parents for a few to, to several more months as they sort of really figure out the logistics of, of how to, to use their bill to, to forage for shellfish. We also have uh, least terns in the state of Connecticut. So um, I mentioned earlier, our piping plovers, oyster catchers, they are um, territorial. So we'll have a pair and then hundred feet later, we'll have another pair and then hundred feet later, another pair. Uh, least terns, which nest on the mainland and then common terns, which nest on the islands. And um, if we're lucky, we have some roseate terns nesting on the islands as well. And if we're really lucky, we might have some black skimmers nesting here and there on the mainland. Um, but those species are all colonial. Um, so, you know, their strategy, um, so the plovers, the oyster catchers, their strategy is let's sort of have our own little territories where we can have our own sort of sources of food. And we are going to rely on our nests being really camouflage in order to avoid um, them being eaten by predators. Uh, common terns, uh, while their eggs and their chicks are still camouflaged, they're congregating together. They're nesting together in a big flock. And um, their strategy is the more eyes, um, the more birds, the more eyes to see predators, um, the more eyes to, to sort of let um, everybody else know if there's some issue or disturbance. Uh, so they're in large flocks. And, you know, if a peregrine falcon flies by, they all immediately take flight. And, and it's, it's you know, they're all kind of keeping an eye out for, for predators or for other disturbances that might impact the nesting colony. Our least terns literally actually arrive um, much later than the oyster catchers and piping plovers. Um, I think they arrived about two weeks ago now, um, you know, gradually. So not too many two weeks ago, more last week. Um, we're starting to get decent numbers of them. We're starting to get our first nests uh, this week. Uh, common terns, um, roseate terns, black skimmers, uh, roughly the same timeline. Black skimmers tend to arrive a little bit later. Um, we are at the far northern end of the just the, the range for black skimmers. Um, the Most of the nesting colonies are Long Island or further south, uh, but we do occasionally get some pairs in Connecticut as well. So um, uh, least terns, um, like common terns, are also uh, what's called semi-precocial. So uh, they are downy when they hatch out of their eggs. Uh, they are somewhat mobile, so they can move around a little bit. Um, but being uh, piscivores, so uh, least terns, common terns, rosy terns, black skimmers, they all rely on, um, they all eat fish. Um, so the chicks are reliant on the adults to go out, uh, catch fish like Mendenhaven, Hayden, or Silversides, and bring them back um, to the colony for the chicks to eat. And about the same time frame, um, you know, for for birds that are precocial or semi-precocial, it's roughly a month of incubation. Um, and after that point, the chick is, you know, you know, like I said, has downy feathers, is fairly mobile. Um, you know, the reason for that long incubation period is that they, the chicks that emerge from the eggs are much more able to sort of attend for themselves, um, you know, compared to an American robin, which has a nesting period, an incubation period of something like eight to 10 days. Um, but when those chicks hatch, they have no feathers. Their eyes are closed. They certainly cannot feed themselves. They cannot walk around themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, the our beach nesting birds sort of use the strategy of uh, let's be camouflage. Let's try to incubate our eggs longer um, or let's nest in colonies so we can all keep an eye out for predators. Um, and uh, so they'll have this longer incubation period, but when their chicks emerge, they are much more able to sort of just get up and walk around and, and hopefully, you know, in the case of plover forage on their own versus a lot of our songbirds, you know, their strategy is let's get nesting done as fast as possible. So short incubation period, um, and then a actually a fairly short, um, you know, uh, period um, between 
hatching and fledging too. Um, I think a robin, it's it's about a 20 days, something like that, um, between you know laying the eggs, hatching, and then fledging. Um, so they try to just get it all done really quickly. One more uh, shorebird that I want to mention is the semi-palmated sandpiper. And this is a migratory shorebird. They do not breed in Connecticut, but I mentioned them because they do stop in Connecticut in really large numbers, especially in the fall. Um, so semi-palmated sandpipers, they nest in marshes and ponds in the Arctic tundra, and they winter in the Caribbean and South America. Uh, during spring migration, uh, many of the semi-palmated sandpipers stop in the Delaware Bay with red knots and ready turned stones and forage on horseshoe crab eggs. And then um, they head up to their Arctic breeding grounds. And then in the fall, uh, they come south, both the adults and then the young of the year. And we can get very large numbers in Connecticut. Um, you know, places like uh, Sandy Point Beach and Bird Sanctuary in West Haven, mouth of the Connecticut River, um, Long Beach and Stratford, and then also Stratford Point and um, Milford Point at the mouth of the Housatonic River are some of the places where we can get, um, especially in fall migration, um, a few to several thousand semi-palmated sandpipers uh, stopping by to utilize those locations. And uh, one thing that I kind of find, find kind of fascinating about semi-palmated sandpiper is uh, probably like seven or eight years ago now, um, the state of Connecticut was actually doing a study where they were um, you know, capturing and banding semi-palmated sandpiper and, and other shorebirds. And, um, you know, I used to see plocks of semi-palmated sandpiper and, and it, it was just, I always just assumed they were different birds any day that I was seeing these flocks of birds. Um, but I went and able, was able to help the state of Connecticut a couple of times with this shorebird banding effort. And uh, what became apparent to me is that it's it's the same birds that are stopping at Milford Point, stopping at Stratford Point um, from year to year. Um, you know, that was something they were able to sort of pick up on by the, the banding was that, you know, for every, I mean, not, not all of the birds, but for every, say, 100 semi-palmated sandpipers that they captured, you know, three or four of them would have bands from the previous year. So it just made me realize that the, the population isn't as huge as I sort of thought it was. Um, that And the birds that we are see stop in Connecticut, you know, from year to year, are really relying on the habitats that we have here in state to rest and refuel. Um, it is an important location to them um, when they're, ma they're making their migrations uh, from the Arctic uh, down to the Caribbean or South America. America in the fall. Okay, um, so I want to take a little bit of time next to just sort of talk about some of the threats that our seabirds and shorebirds are facing. Uh, so historically, um, you know, piping plovers, least terns, uh, they were hunted um, for meat or just for the sporting sporting industry. Um, and then they were also hunted for the millinery trade. Um, this was, you know, early in the 20th century. And um, as a result of, of hunting and the millinery trade, the, the number of birds of these species uh, was dropping pretty dramatically. Um, you know, egrets, herons, similarly, you know, they were hunted for their feathers um, as well as for subsistence food, for recreation. Um, and, uh, you know, it was sort of brought to light that this was happening. Um, I think that's how the, the National Audubon Society came to be. Um, you know, some women in the Boston area said, hey, we need to do something about this. And um, that's how the National Audubon Society was formed. Um, and that sort of awareness of the impact we were having on our bird species led to the um, enactment of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918, um, which basically protects um, any uh, native bird species um, from from sort of um, being being hunted or um, in, uh, impacted by human disturbance or any sort of human human uh, uh, caused problem, oil spills, uh, hitting electrical lines, that sort of thing. Um, so that act really was. Uh, very effective. It did increase the populations of piping plovers, oyster catchers, um, until about the 1940s. And then, um, you know, with increased recreation, increased development along our shorelines, um, those species started to tank again. And um, uh, in 1986, the piping plover was listed on the Federal Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. And um, the good thing about that is when a species gets listed on the, the Federal Endangered Species Act, it means a lot more funding um, goes to the conservation and management of that species. So um, that um, 1986 was sort of a vital moment for the piping plover um, and meant that from that point forward, a lot more energy can kind of go into the protection of that species. So uh, hunting, uh, you know, recreational hunting, um, millinery trade were some of the early threats to our, our beach and island nesting birds. Uh, but they are still facing threats today. 
Um, so natural disturbances are, are an issue. Um, you know, climate change is calling, causing our seas to rise. We are getting um, uh, more, more and more, more storms and more intense storms than we did historically. And uh, uh, the combination of sea level rise and more intense storms means that we are seeing um, nests getting washed out uh, more frequently than they have in the past. Um, one thing that's leading to a lot more work for, um, you know, Audubon staff and our partners is that we set up the, the fencing, the string fencing that goes around the nesting areas roughly in, um, in the month of April. And uh, we, the last couple of years, get a storm sometime later in the month of April that washes out all of the string fencing, and then we have to set it up all over again. So um, that is sort of one of the, the impacts we are seeing from climate change is these more frequent and more intense storms that are causing all of our fencing to get washed away and then we have to set it up all over again. So it is kind of causing, you know, um, we're ending up with a doubling of efforts to get our, our string fencing up that protects these nesting areas. Uh, there are also predators that um, can be found on the beach that are sort of a natural challenge that our, our, our seabirds and shorebirds face. Um, and some of these predators are natural. They would be there um, regardless, but um, things like trash left on the beaches um, by people can actually increase the number of predators that are at the beach. So, um, you know, between coastal storms and predators, these birds are, are facing a good number of threats. Uh, but then there is also the, the sort of threats of human disturbance. Um, so people being on the beaches and not being mindful of the birds um, can have an impact on these species as well. Um, you know, these shorebirds have this very limited space to, to nest or to, to stop over, you know, between the, the high tide line and um, sort of coastal development. And we do have a lot of coastal development in Connecticut. So um, it is a very limited space that they they can utilize. And um, trash that's left on the beach um, can attract predators. Uh, those two oyster catcher checks that I talked about in, uh, that were banded in 2020, um, one of the reasons we actually had to, we made, to put in the effort to capture those chicks and ban them is that one of them had fishing line wrapped around his neck. Um, so we wanted to capture that bird, get the fishing line off. We banded it so that it could, you know, hopefully, um, you know, continue, you know, so we could keep track of that bird going forward. Um, but that's sort of the, one of the challenges of sort of trash is that, um, you know, this can, not only does it attract predators, but it can, you know, um, you know, a bird can get tangled up in that trash as well. Uh, human disturbance can also be in the form of people just getting too close to exclosures or string fencing, um, people bringing pets to the beach, um, we don't see too many people driving vehicles on the beach like cars, but we definitely have people driving uh, ATVs, four-wheel drive vehicles, um, and also e-bikes on the beaches in Connecticut. Um, e-bikes are kind of a, a new challenge that we're dealing with. Um, one of the, the big issues with sort of ATVs or four-wheel drive vehicles on the beach is, I mean, first A, they could they could run over a chick or they could run over a nest. But the also other challenge is that they leave these very big tracks on the beach and a little dinky plover chick that's the size of a marshmallow can actually get trapped in those tread marks. Um, and the same is true for, for e-bikes. Um, they have these really big tires. Um, they do make leave these big sort of um, tread lines on the beach and a, a little plover chick might get into one of those tread lines and then it doesn't really have a way to get out. It'll go up and down the tread line, but it doesn't have a way to get out. Um, it's overall, this is not hasn't been a huge problem in Connecticut yet, but it is definitely a problem that um, other states have. And so, um, you know, we are very conscious of, you know, when, you know, if we see people with ATVs or four-wheel drive vehicles on the bikes, letting them know that they really shouldn't be doing that um, in nesting areas. So um, next part of the presentation, I want to get into the different ways that um, Audubon and our partners uh, from, you know, Audubon chapters to government agencies like the Connecticut DEP and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, to municipalities, uh, to the hundreds of volunteers that come out and help us um, on the beach um, each summer. Um, I want to just talk about some of the ways that we are working to steward and manage our beach nesting birds. Um, so um, we're basically going to talk just a bit about habitat management, about sort of education and outreach, about advocacy, um, monitoring, and then scientific research. So these are kind of the different ways that we are able to help these birds uh, successfully raise their young or ensure that they have stopover habitat that they can use um, when they are making their migrations. Um, so first thing that um, we are able to do is in these areas where we have nesting birds, 
uh, Audubon, Connecticut, the Connecticut Audubon Society of Nature Conservancy. We all work with the state of Connecticut's um, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Wildlife Division to set up string fencing. Um, so at beaches where um, we get birds every single year, we, we kind of take the initiative and get that string fencing up um, you know, right away. And then um, we're also looking out for additional nests at maybe places that we don't see nests every year. So just one example is um, Black Point, which I believe is in maybe East Lyme. Um, this is the site that, you know, up until uh, 2022, we never had nesting birds there. And then in 2022, we had a pair show up and um, they are back again in 2023. So that's a place where we weren't necessarily always setting up string fencing, but if a bird arrives, um, pair piping plovers arrive, we do want to get the fencing up. Um, the fencing is psychological fencing. You know, any person could easily sort of climb underneath the string fencing or, or climb through it. Um, but we hope that that it makes people stop and think like, hey, what is this barrier all about? And they read the sign and understand that this is a nesting area and that um, it would be really not good for the birds if they were to sort of proceed into the string fencing. Uh, we use a variety of signs from sort of regulatory signs to um, kid-made signs. And the kid-made signs are actually more effective because people go, oh, look at the cute pictures that some kids drew and they come in and they read the sign, um, you know, versus the sort of regulatory signs are a little bit more like, ah, let's not read that. So kid made signs, very effective. And then we also put up exclosures around um, our piping plover nests. So piping plovers actually walk in and out of, um, you know, walk to and from their nest. They don't fly in. Um, they just walk to and from their nest along the shoreline. So we're, uh, the state of Connecticut has a procedure for setting up um, exclosures around nests. And uh, the birds uh, basically, you know, they kind of put the exclosure on the nest really quickly. And then they wait to make sure that the bird does go back to the nest afterwards. Um, and if the bird doesn't go back to the nest afterwards, they remove the exclosure very quickly. Um, but the plovers will just sort of walk in and out of the, the exclosures. Um, so they're able to get to their eggs to incubate. And then predators, um, you know, like gulls, crows, raccoons, foxes are not able to sort of get in there and, um, and eat the eggs. Another thing that we can do that's a fairly simple um, way to sort of improve the habitat for beach, beach and island nesting birds is to set up um, turn shelters or just little shelters um, that the birds can either utilize for nesting in the case of turns um, or they can use utilize them as a place to get shade. And, um, you know, one thing, uh, Connecticut doesn't do a lot of sort of creating turn shelters, but um, uh, my colleagues on Long Island do do this. And um, so they create these turn shelters that they make a lot of them. A lot of them go to Great Gall Island, um, which is at the tip of Long Island, which is um, the largest common turn colony in in, uh, in this sort of New York, Connecticut area. I think it's something like 10,000 pairs of common turns, but it also has a thousand pairs of roseate turns, which are uh, federally endangered. So they create these sort of uh, turn nesting structures that can be used at Great Gall Island. Um, but uh, they're also putting them at other beaches and they can be a way of sort of attracting uh, least turns to beaches. And uh, last summer, we had some plovers that were nesting at ham and acid um, at West Beach. And, uh, you know, when there wasn't too much vegetation. So um, in the heat of the summer, uh, somebody put a not quite a turn shelter, but basically took a, a piece of wood and, you know, put it, uh, leaned it against a post and the plovers totally took shelter underneath it. Um, it was a way of just getting uh, some shade on a really hot day. So something we might think about utilizing a little bit more um, in the years ahead is some sort of uh, sort of shade structures that um, our plovers, oyster catchers and terns can utilize on really hot summer days. Now, string fencing, exclosures, turn shelters, um, they're kind of like the easy ways to, to manage habitat for our beach and island nesting birds. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, you have to go a bit further than that. And I want to give an example, which is the Barnegat Lighthouse um, in a sort of air restoration area down in New Jersey. And um, so uh, our beach nesting birds, they like to be able to have a lot of sort of open beach. They want to be able to see down the beach in one direction, turn their head, see down the beach in the other direction. So if a beach has a lot of vegetation on it, which is a natural thing, you know, if um, a beach doesn't get a severe storm after a couple of years, you will get a lot of vegetation growing on a beach. And um, when that happens, the birds are actually much less likely to use that beach, um, you know, going for after a certain point, because they, if you they have a lot of vegetation, then they can't see their predators. Um, and so it feels like a much, a, a less, a, a, a less safe place um, for plovers or oyster catchers or least turns to nest. Um, so at Barnegat Light, um, there was a large area of sort of sandy beach um, 
but over the years it had gotten really vegetated and um you know sometimes things like a nor'easter or a hurricane can sort of be a reset and kind of wash away a lot of the vegetation so you get this sort of open area again for nesting um but that hadn't happened after several years so uh the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, uh, Rutgers University, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Army Corps of Engineers decided to take steps to sort of reset this beach for the birds. Uh, first thing they did was in 2018 to 2019, they removed the vegetation. And then from 2019 to 2020, they created high quality foraging habitat um, in the form of a shallow pool. And then um, afterwards, they obviously fence the habitat, just like we do in Connecticut with string fencing, um, to make sure that those birds um, could utilize that area without disturbance. Uh, so this is what it looked like um, before restoration. And this is what it looked like after restoration. So um, you can see there's an abundance of sort of open space um, that the birds were able to utilize. And they did see uh, a large increase in the number of seabirds and shorebirds that were using the site after restoration. So um, we can do a lot to sort of manage the habitat for birds from string fencing to exclosures to turn shelters to actual hardcore habitat restoration. Um, but we also need to take the time to educate the people who are coming to the beach. And uh, there are several ways that Audubon Connecticut and New York are working to do that. Uh, one of the ways that Audubon New York does this, and they're very successful about it, is they actually um, have educators from the, the Theodore Roosevelt Audubon Center who go to local schools um, teach the kids about the beach nesting birds, sort of similar to, to my talk today. And um, then they um, ask the kids to sort of make signs about the birds. And um, those signs, end up, uh, they pick the sort of best four or five, and then they, um, you know, print them out on sort of, um, you know, sort of a six to eight millimeter plastic. Um, and then they put those signs up at the beaches where they have beach nesting birds. And um, they have a press event, so they really kind of make the kids feel special, like, hey, you guys made these signs, you're going to protect some birds. Um, but it's a, a really popular, really successful program. Uh, so that is a, a way that our, our office out on Long Island is in sort of engaging young kids, so elementary school kids, in sort of the conservation of beach nesting birds. Um, in Connecticut, we have the Wild Life Guards program, and this is a program that has been in existence, I think we are... We are into our 10th year now, um, but this is a program we started in 2012, um, and the program basically provides um, training, mentoring, and employment to uh, students um, in West Haven and Bridgeport, um, and then those students, after they get a good amount of training, actually become the official beach nesting bird monitors at their local beach. So in Bridgeport, it's Pleasure Beach. Um, in West Haven, it's Sandy Point Beach and Bird Sanctuary. And uh, we're actually planning on expanding the program to Long Beach and Stratford next year. So um, super excited about that. Um, but these students have the opportunity to, to gain job skills, um, particularly in the field of conservation, um, make connections. Um, they, you know, they get to go on field trips every week. So they also get this chance to sort of learn about different careers in conservation um, as part of the program. And it's one way that we are uh, really, you know, between our sort of educational programs for elementary school students to having um, sort of employment programs for high school students. Uh, then we have sort of crew leader positions, which are for college aid students. Um, and then we have field staff as well. Um, we are really trying to build this sort of ladder to careers in conservation um, for students across um, Long Island and Connecticut. Another program um, that is uh, really successful in New York, we don't do it as much in Connecticut, um, but that is the Be a Good Egg program. And uh, this is uh, in on Long Island. Um, my colleagues will basically uh, pick a day or, or several days that they'll be at the beach, you know, with tents, with tables, with brochures, um, you know, uh, and they will ask people to take the Be a Good Egg pledge, <clears throat> which is to ask people to stay out of the string fencing, not bring dogs to the beach, and then also to make sure they pick up their trash. So three simple things that people can do um, that will be beneficial to our beach and island nesting birds as well as migratory shorebirds. And um, they're very successful in Connecticut in uh, Long Island. We've tried it in Connecticut. We don't do it as much in Connecticut um, just because um, it's a it works, but it's not as we don't get a, the number of people coming to Connecticut beaches that 
um, that have been nesting birds that they see on Long Island. So, um, you know, just as an example, like um, one of the beaches on Long Island where they do this, they they can get thousands of people coming to that beach on any given day. Um, so there's a real opportunity to talk to a lot of people um, versus at some of our Connecticut beaches, it can be pretty quiet sometimes, um, you know, where we have the beaches where we have birds nesting, where we also, you know, have an opportunity for people to visit. Um, we've tried it in Connecticut, we've done it in Connecticut, um, but we don't have quite as developed a program as they have in Long Island. And it just has to do with the fact that we don't have, you know, um, quite as many people coming to the beaches where we have beach nesting birds as they do on um, the sort of southern shore of Long Island. Now, another way that we can protect our beach nesting birds is actually by advocating for legislation. And um, Audubon, Connecticut did actually, um, you know, develop some legislation this past uh, fall, and um, it was actually introduced by the Environmental Committee um, this during this Connecticut General Assembly session, and it's slowly but surely still making its way forward. Um, I don't want to sort of get in the details of sort of the, the 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 sort of ups and downs it's sort of faced in the legislative session, but um, you know, I want to just tell you a little bit about this this uh, this uh, legislation and kind of um, you know what we what we sort of originally had proposed. So uh, one of the challenges we face at our beaches is that uh, there are a lot of times there are rules in place already that say, you know, you can't bring dogs to this beach, um, you can't drive ATVs on this beach, um, and most people follow the rules, but there is the one, two, three, maybe five percent that don't care, and they're going to bring their dog to the beach, they're going to drive their ATV on the beach anyways, um, despite the fact that there is a rule in place, and uh, despite the fact that, you know, they've been asked multiple times, like, please don't bring your dog to the beach. It's, you know, you're not allowed to do that. Or please don't drive an ATV on the beach. It's not allowed. Um, so what this rule, this legislation actually do is it would actually make it an infraction. So um, while these rules exist at um, these beaches already, um, they are, they're actually not that easy to enforce um, because it's sort of a, a local regulation. Um, but this legislation would actually make it um, a state infraction. So it would basically say that, yes, if you have a, a you know, if you go into the string fencing, um, you know, that is, that is, there's a fine for that. Or if you uh, bring your ATV or a dog, uh, you know, within a certain distance of the string fencing, there, there is, you know, that, that is a fine. And um, the hope is that if we can get a version of this legislation passed, that um, just a few tickets could make a huge difference. You know, if, if you know, um, one person gets a ticket and then word gets out that, hey, yeah, you know, if you if you do bring your dog to this beach or you do drive your ATV on this beach, um, you, there will be, you will get a ticket and you'll have to either pay it or you'll have to go to court um, to try to get out of it. Um, hopefully the idea is that a few tickets could make a, a huge difference in sort of reducing the amount of disturbance uh, at these beaches. So fingers crossed, um, you know, we should actually know in the next week or so, um, if we're going to get some legislation passed. So, um, it's been, an, uh, it's been a, it's been ex an exciting spring, just sort of you know, watching this legislation and sort of seeing how it does and, and, uh, we will see what happens. So, okay. Um, two more areas, um, that Audubon and partners, um, sort of work on one is monitoring and monitoring is required for us to understand if we are being successful in our management of beach nesting birds, our stewardship of beach nesting birds, and in our education and engagement campaigns. The, globe, the goal for piping plovers is 200 pairs along the entire East Coast. And we are literally like right on the edge of that. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully a few more years of really good stewardship and management and education about the species, and we'll get beyond that 2000 uh, bird goal. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can stop doing it because if we stop doing all the work we're doing, there's a pretty good chance that they'll go back down. Um, and this is a species that does need a lot of attention. Uh, but, um, you know, we do monitoring of our beach nesting birds and shorebirds that are migrating through the state just to understand if, if all of our efforts are making a difference. Uh, we also do research. So I mentioned that um, Audubon, Connecticut has had an active American oyster catcher banding program uh, since 2018. Um, at this point, um, we've banded about 60% of individuals or about 30% of the 
uh, or we've abandoned about 60 individual oyster catchers or about 30% of the Connecticut breeding population has bands on it. Um, so if you go to a place like Sandy Point in West Haven, you'll see N17, N14, and uh, 5T. Those are the three of the birds that are banded there. There's three pairs and one bird of each pair is banded. So we can actually, it helps us keep track of those pairs and understand um, you know, how they are using the habitat, if they're changing mates, if they're moving around. Uh, one of those birds, I believe it's N17 actually, goes to the Gulf of Fonseca in El Salvador in the winter. Um, it's been recited down there, which is kind of incredible. Um, so some of the things we're learning about banding from banning our oyster catchers is that, you know, we're getting a sense of where they winter. So some of them just go down to New York and that's about as far south as they go to winter. But then we have birds like N17 at Sandy Point who goes all the way down to Central America. Um, uh, one thing we've noticed is that the birds that have a short migration, they don't leave until, you know, middle of September. <coughs> Excuse me. But the birds that have this much longer migration, uh, they're going to basically leave as soon as they finish nesting. So if they're able to successfully fledge their first clutch of chicks, then come July, they're out of here. They want to head down there. They've got this long migration ahead of them. So they're going to leave uh, sooner than the birds that have a shorter migration. Uh, we're also learning about where there are staging areas in the state of Connecticut um, and also in the state of Rhode Island. So staging areas are spots where um, pairs will meet up in the spring before they go to their nesting areas, and then they'll go back there in the fall before they, you know, say adieu and, and head off in their separate directions. And then they come back in the spring, they meet up there, and then they go to their breeding areas. So, um, you know, Milford Point is one of the sort of mouth, the Houstonic is one of the major staging areas in Connecticut. Um, Norwalk Islands are another staging area. Westbrook Barrier Islands, another staging area, and then Napa Tree Point in Rhode Island is, is sort of the fourth staging area that's sort of in the Long Island Sound. Uh, we're also learning about sort of a lifetime reproductive success, lifetime survival, um, and also uh, mate and site fidelity. So we have definitely seen instances of, of if we didn't have bands on the birds, we wouldn't realize it, but they do switch mates a little bit more often than we thought they did. And they do switch nest sites a little bit more often than we thought they did. Um, we used to think that it was the same pair that was coming back and nesting at the same spot year after year, but we do realize now that there was a little bit more switching going around than we thought previously. Uh, one other area of research that we're doing um, in partnership with Virginia Tech, um, other Audubon sort of state or regional offices, um, Manomet, um, and I think U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, we have spent a good amount of time um, collecting data on the impacts of human disturbance on shorebirds uh, from, you know, are the you know which sites do they go to? Uh, you know what is their how is their abundance impacted by disturbance? How is their behavior impacted by disturbance? How is their nesting success impacted by disturbance? So there was a, a huge study that was done, basically along the entire Atlantic Flyway, um, looking at how disturbance impacts our shorebirds, and um, pretty much across the board, where you have more human disturbance, you know, from people on the beach, dogs on the beach, um, other types of disturbance you see um, less birds using those sites. Those birds are spending less time foraging and resting. They are um, seen in less numbers where there's more disturbance and their nesting success is lower. So basically across the board, um, this study was able to show that human disturbance really does have an impact on these birds um, from whether or not they use a the site to their behavior um, to their nesting success. So uh, in 2022, we actually implemented strategies um, to try to uh, reduce human disturbance. And uh, we used what's called community-based social marketing. So it's sort of coming up with a strategy or an idea that, um, you know, that people would actually sort of think was, hey, this is kind of fun to adopt. Um, let, you know, it kind of uh, tries to um, increase awareness about the birds and the threats they're facing, but in a way that is going to be make it easier for for a community to adopt. Um, so we did this at Long Beach and at Milford Point here in Connecticut, and um, we really wanted to try to convince people to walk around flocks more. And so um, one things we did we did was we used very nice signs with really cool graphics that sort of showed um, you know people walking around flocks of birds. Um, also, we wanted people to sort of time their visit to sites with the tides, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more um, on another slide. Uh, on Long Island, my colleague Shelby, um, she really wanted to sort of tackle the issue of dogs. So um, on Long Island, there are beaches where people can bring their dogs, um, but they do need to be on leashes. So she really wanted to get out the idea that, you know, you know, even though your dog is adorable and sweet and cute, 
um, birds don't see it that way. Um, and they can, it can, you know, a dog even on a leash can, can really scare a bird. So you can see the, the sign on the bottom left corner that she created that you got, had this cute little puppy, um, but you see, you can see the birds and you can see how it's sort of causing some stress to them. And so she wanted to uh, sort of get out to the word of the impacts that dogs can have, but in a way that people would, I know, hopefully feel a bit more passionate and concerned about the birds um, and really maybe think about whether or not they're going to bring their dog to those locations. So uh, I kind of want to end the presentation is just on um, the ways that you can all help us um, make sure that these birds have a, nest, a chance to successfully raise their young and a space where they can stop uh, to forage and rest during migration. And the first step step is to, to take the Be A Good Egg Pledge. Um, if, if you haven't had a chance to, to take it yet, um, go to you know, ct.audubon.org slash bird friendly at the beach. And you can take the Be A Good Egg Pledge um, you know, to... Um, you know, stay out of the string fencing, uh, not bring dogs to the beach and not leave trash on the beach. So three simple things that anybody can do when they're visiting the beaches this summer. So that's step number one, what you can do to help these birds out and spread the word about the, the sort of be a good eye pledge as well. And then um, second step is get to know a beach before you visit. So, um, you know, a uh, a lot of people, you know, so Long Beach in Stratford, Milford Point in Milford, Sandy Point, West Haven, Griswold Point in Old Lyme, um, and also our state beaches. Um, dogs are really prohibited during the breeding season, roughly from, from April through September. Um, and, you know, so dogs shouldn't be on the beach. So if you're a dog owner, um, you know, it's good to, you know, good to know you can, can bring your dog to the beach and other times of the year, but, you know, really bringing them to these beaches specifically um, during this particular period can really have a negative effect on these birds. So, you know, just looking at the regulations, whether it's about dogs or ATVs or fires on the beach, or, you know, it's just good to get to know these locations and understand um, what is allowed, what isn't allowed, and the impacts that um, act certain activities can have. Um, also just getting to know the sort of the layout of a beach. So this is Sandy Point in West Haven um, and the picture here. And uh, Sandy Point is actually made up of two points. The North Point, which is the sort of official Sandy Point, um, which is this area right here, or let's see, this area right here. And then there's Morse Point, which is this area down here. And the Morse Point is actually where all the beach nesting birds are. They're on this area here. But you can go out on the Sandy Point and you can get great views of those birds and not cause any disturbance. So, um, you know, I, I like to say if you're going to go to Sandy Point during the breeding season, um, if you want to see some of the plover chicks or oyster catchers, go just stick to Sandy Point, bring a scope, bring your binoculars, um, and you should be able to see these birds um, and also maintain and give them plenty of space to be able to raise their young and, and forage. Um, versus if you go out on Morse Point, um, you know, especially if you go at high tide, then there is really limited space for the birds. So um, recommend going at low tide and sticking to uh, Sandy Point proper, which is the, the northernmost spit. And there's a trail that goes from the parking lot right out here. So it's a nice, easy way to sort of get out and get some looks at the birds that utilize Sandy Point without causing much disturbance. Um, and also think about the sort of timing of your visit. And there's sort of sort of two ways to think about timing. There's sort of what time of year to visit and then what tide to visit. So let's just start with the time of year. So um, March to early May, um, we have plovers, we have oyster catchers, we have um, you know, least turns. We have shorebirds coming through, um, but we don't have any chicks on the beach yet. The birds are incubating. Um, so it is actually a time that you can go to the beach and, and not cause too much disturbance. Uh, similarly, in September and October, um, the shorebird migration is actually spread out over a long period of time. Um, it's the most intense in sort of late July, early August, uh, but you can still see a whole variety of shorebirds in September and October, and there are no beach nesting bird chicks on the beach. So March to early May and September to October are really good times to visit a beach um, and sort of see the, the bird life and other wildlife that um, can be found at those locations. Um, if you are careful and give um, flocks of birds space, um, July, late July, early August can be another good time to sort of visit the beach. Um, certainly is an exciting time because there are huge flocks of shorebirds um, moving through, uh, but just be conscious of giving those birds space, walking around flocks. Um, by then, a lot of our chicks have already fledged, so you're less likely to have an impact on, on sort of birds that are nesting on those beaches. Um, and as long as you give the, the migrating shorebirds plenty of space, um, that can be an okay time to visit the beach. 
the time that we actually really got to ask people to maybe think about not going to the beach is mid-May through mid-July. So we are literally just getting into this time period. And this is when we do have a lot of chicks on the beach. Um, a place like Sandy Point, um, Milford Point, Long Beach, um, you know, these piping plovers, oyster catchers, they all kind of arrive roughly at the same time. They inc start incubating their nests roughly at the same time. Their chicks hatch roughly at the same time. So you could have 30, 40 chicks at one of these locations. And if there was a lot of people visiting that location, that could really have a negative impact on a large number of chicks. Um, so we really ask that if you can, if you, you know, can avoid it, please don't go to these nesting beaches, um, you know, in that mid-May to mid-July period. Um, you really can have a, a pretty negative impact on these young chicks fairly easily. So um, it's not a good time to visit the beach. The other thing to think about is sort of timing your visit with the tide. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, we have low tide, we have high tide, we have mid tide. And um, visiting at low tide is actually the best time to go. Um, at low tide, um, you know, my uh, coworker Beth came up with some cute little phrasing. So low tide is for feeding. Walk around flocks because birds are resting and eating. So um, at low tide, you know, you've got a lot of space. Um, the migratory shorebirds are going to be farther out, closer to the water foraging. The nesting birds are going to be um, up along the dunes. Between the, the shoreline and, and the dunes, there's a lot of space. So people can visit the beach, see these birds, um, and not cause too much disturbance. At mid-tide, a um, little bit less space, um, but as long as you're conscious of walking around flocks and staying out of the string fencing, um, stay sticking to the wet sand is sort of recommended. Um, you know, you can visit the beach at mid-tide and, and still not cause a lot of disturbance to the birds. Uh, high tide is the one time that we sort of ask if you're kind of thinking about when to go to the beach on a certain day. Check the tides, um, saltwatertide.com. Great website to go to. Very easy to sort of look up the tides at 40 different locations in Connecticut. And um, if you can avoid going at high tide, this is really when there's the least amount of space on the beach. So a lot of times the water line is right up near the string fencing. You know, our beach nesting birds are in the string fencing. Our migratory shorebirds are sort of also um, consolidated in the string fencing. And um, going to the beach at that time, you know, inevitably, unless you're willing to get your feet wet and walk in the water, which I do sometimes if I'm if I'm monitoring the birds and I don't want to impact them by walking the water, um, going at high tide is when you're it's the hardest to avoid the birds because there just isn't as much space on our beaches. Um, so keep the tide in mind when you're visiting the beaches this summer. Um, definitely low tide. Um, you know, uh, maybe waiting until middle of July before you make your next trip to the beach to do some birding. Um, those are sort of um, the times to go. Okay, and then um, also last step is sort of just use best practices for reducing disturbance to birds. So um, we've got the string fencing up. Sometimes a bird will nest sort of pretty close to the edge of the string fencing. So if you can, if you have uh, low tide or mid tide and you've got the space, try to still stay about 10 feet away from the string fencing. Um, Give birds space, so migrating shorebirds, if you see a big flock of them, um, try to give them um, space roughly about 100 feet. So that's equated to 16 beach towels, uh, 20 dog leashes, or six kayaks. Uh, one thing we ask is do not linger very long in any one area. Um, if we have nesting birds, if we have chicks, if you're lingering too long in any one space, one, any one spot, um, the parents are going to be, um, you know, maybe uh, trying to sort of lead you away from the chicks or lead you away from the nest um, the whole time that you're there. And then during that time period, they are not tending to their chicks. They are not feeding their chicks. Um, they are not sheltering their chicks underneath their wings or their body. Um, you know, so uh, it's, you know, if you're visiting the beach, get a good, get a look, but then keep moving. Um, don't linger in any one area. And then again, uh, best practice, carry carry in, carry out. Um, don't, you know, if you're going to the beach, you're going to spend some time there, bring some snacks with you, make sure you bring your trash out with you. And then the last thing is just please help us get out the word about these beach nesting birds and the, the little things that we can all do to um, give them a chance to nest successfully in here in Connecticut. And then also make sure our, our shorebirds that are migrating through have habitat that they can utilize. So um, if you just Google sort of share the shore, um, lots and lots of, of links will come up with information on best practices for sharing the shore and other ways you could help us get out the word about these birds. And with that, I thank you for um, inviting me to, to talk to uh, the chapter today and uh, um, uh, maybe see you out on the beaches this summer. Questions, I'm open for questions.
We do have a few questions. Let's see. Uh, Claudia, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Maybe not. I'll uh, I'll ask it then. Got it. I got ah, it. There you go. My, my question was, how big are the enclosures for the beach to protect the birds from the sun? Are they like two feet by two feet, or are they like six inches by twelve inches? I think they're pretty small. I think they're you know like I saw one Monday at a meeting, and um, I, I would say it's uh, um. Maybe six inches by six inches, I would say, is about the size of these um, sort of triangular right. turn shelters. They're really small for the birds to get into. Well, yeah, they're not the biggest birds. I mean, especially the plover chicks, the least turn chicks, they're not that big, um, you know, so, um, but but uh, they could be a little bit bigger, but I, they're not huge. I would say that one feet by one feet like triangle is is bigger than the ones that I saw. Okay. Um, so there's some, maybe they're about eight inches, you know, sort of a triangle that's like each side is about eight inches maybe. And I've never seen any. So I was surprised to learn something about that tonight. Might be something you see more of in Connecticut. Um, you know, definitely it's not something we've done a lot of in the past, but um, you know, especially last summer when we sort of just kind of recreated one by just leaning a board against a, a signpost and we actually saw the plover chicks using it. They kind of made us realize that, hey, maybe having something like that wouldn't be a bad thing. Monongatuck, if you're looking for a project, if you want to make us some turn shelters. Yeah, um, maybe high schools that have shop could volunteer to do that. We'll yeah. Realize. I, I think we'd be interested in trying out some, um, you know, I think it's, like I said, we, you know, New York does it. Um, we kind of just made a makeshift one really quickly last summer and saw the birds using it. I think it's something we'd be interested in uh, potentially uh, trying out at some beaches this summer or next summer. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. I would say we would be interested in working on that. And if you can get the specs um, from uh, TR, that would be good. Okay. I will, I'll reach out to Shelby and, and I'll be in touch. Excellent. Heidi, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I was just wondering if you do um, enforce uh, tickets at the beaches, would the, the funds from the tickets that are paid go back into your work? That is a great question, Heidi. Um, and it's not something that we necessarily thought about when sort of putting together this legislation. Um, I think that it is something that, um, you know, I think when you're you're trying to get legislation passed, it's sort of almost like baby steps, you know, like you want to get just get something passed first, and then you can, you know, take steps down the line to sort of, you know, improve or sort of change the legislation in ways that um, might be beneficial. And I think that idea of like, um, you know, if somebody gets a, a ticket for doing something, if they, you know, if that, you know, sometimes when somebody gets a ticket, they can make a donation um, sort of in lieu of sort of paying the, the infraction. Um, and I think that is sort of an idea that we've talked about a little bit is that if, you know, maybe tickets for for various things, maybe instead of, um, maybe that's something to talk, it's a uh, conversations that need to be have had with probate courts um, to sort of um, see if that, um, if judges would be interested in sort of throwing out the idea of like, okay, well, um, you could pay this ticket or you could fight it in court, or you can make a donation to, um, you know, the Audubon Alliance for Coastal Water Birds and that money will go towards sort of protecting uh, our beach nesting bird species. So um, it would be nice if somehow the amount of the ticket does go back to the work that you do in some way rather than just, you know, going into the system. I agree. I, I like that idea. I will uh, I'll bring that up with our policy director. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Uh, Lori Reynolds. Thanks, Dennis. Hi, Corey. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I don't know if you saw the listserv comments this week on Sunday with the redneck fowler that was at Sandy Point. 
and there was concerns that maybe the birders were not um, observing all the string fencing and everything and whether you have some thoughts about that and maybe some messaging that can be shared um, during migration season with the birders as a, re as a reminder. And I, I would think that probably the birders are even more respectful than people who are, you know, letting their dogs roam when they shouldn't be. Um, but just wondering if you have any comment on that. Yeah, it's, I think that is a tricky, it is a tricky situation. Like I, I get that, you know, being a birder, I, I get that sometimes you do really want to see a bird, but um, I think that it can, there are ways to do it, you know, in that are going to be less impactful. Um, I know, you know, just as you think about photography, right? If you, if you really want to photograph birds, you should invest in a really good zoom lens. So you can photograph birds and keep a distance, um, you know, so similar to, you know, with, with sort of going to sort of chase a rarity, um, you know, I think it's important to think about how can you do that without having an impact, you know, or, or reducing your impact, um, you know, so for, for this, this, you know, this, the foul rope at, at Sandy Point last weekend, um, go at low tide. Um, that would be a, a, a sort of easy way. That's when there's more space on the beach. Um, you know, thankfully we didn't have any uh, chicks last weekend, you know, literally our first chicks net hatch today, but, um, but it is, um, that does happen. You know, there was, um, what was there a couple of years ago, there was Rosie at Spoonville showed up at Sandy Point too. Um, and people flooded to Sandy Point to see the Rosie at Spoonville. Um, in that instance, it was actually, the timing was, was good because, uh, well, it wasn't, we had our wildlife guards program running at that time. So we had wildlife guards that were on the, the in the parking lot talking to people about how they can, um, you know, what they can do to sort of reduce their impact on the beach nesting birds. So, you know, a lot of the people who went to sort of see the Rosie at Spoonville that was at Sandy Point um, a couple of summers ago, they actually took the Be A Good Egg Pledge. So they did get the sort of um, opportunity to, they did get some education while they were there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the birding community in Connecticut, probably a lot of them know, um, you know, what you should or shouldn't do when when sort of visiting um, beaches that have nesting birds. And I, I hope that they are they are mindful. Um, I think we do a, a pretty good job of sort of getting out the word via the press, via um, communications um, with our membership, via newsletters. Um, you know, certainly Mononcatuck uh, helps lend a hand in that, too. Um, you know, there is lots of opportunity to learn about these birds and sort of the steps that anyone can take to help them out. Um, you know, and so hopefully, hopefully birders are mindful of that um, when they are chasing a rarity. Does anybody else have a question? If so, unmute yourself and ask. Corey, can I ask a question? You mentioned early on, it's sort of a little bit off topic, but you mentioned that there were some efforts also being done at Havanasset or other state parks. And could you just touch on any of the partnering um, that you're doing as well with some of the parks, especially Havanasset? Yeah, so um, at Havanasset, um, you know, so this is this is this is kind of more salt marsh work than than anything else. But um, uh, Audubon um, very recently, um, you know, with with many partners, so from Monongahela Audubon Society to the Meg's Point Nature Center to University of Connecticut to Ducks Unlimited to the State of Connecticut, um, NOAA, um, and we some you know submitted a proposal to get some funding to do the sort of initial assessment um, that is sort of required to. Um, sort of think through um, the development of a living shoreline for the eastern shore of um, sort of the the Meg's Point area. Um, I think probably a lot of people have have gone on that boardwalk that or that walk that goes out to sort of the the uh, Hamo Nassau Natural Area Preserve. There's that that trail and you get to this um, viewing platform at the end. And if you've noticed in the last 10 years, the shore and the viewing platform are getting closer and closer and closer um, to the point where uh, Dennis, I, I swear I have a picture somewhere of you with the wildlife guards from like 10 years ago and the shoreline is like 200 feet away. Now it's 10 feet away. Um, so it's not the platform um, that's moved. 
No, no, it isn't. So that um, area of the marsh there has lost about 13 acres in the last 20 years. Um, it is eroding really rapidly. So, um, you know, Audubon and partners are going to be doing some, you know, initial assessment of sort of wind wave uh, sediment transport along that shoreline to sort of understand what are the causes of the erosion and then hopefully come up with some conceptual designs for uh, some sort of living shoreline that would prevent future erosion of that area. Um, we're also going to be um, working with state parks to uh, look at some of the culverts that go um, underneath the road. Uh, you know, they look like they're kind of pinch points for sort of tidal creeks um, in the marshes at Hammond Acid. And we want to understand, um, you know, if they're if they're they're functional, um, you know, if they need to be maybe changed or replaced with sort of larger culverts so that the water can sort of flow in and out of the marsh more easily. Um, and then there's a very big uh, sort of environment. Well, not very big, but it's a, an environment. There's an environmental justice component to the work, too. So, um, you know, uh, Audubon is going to be um, working with Monocotuck Audubon to sort of support the Urbanscape program. Um, the we're going to be passing funding to Monongatuck Audubon Society to work with the students um, from New Hallville uh, to uh, try to grow some salt marsh plants. Um, nobody is growing salt marsh plants in Connecticut. So there is, um, you know, and we're buying uh, plants for say, a restoration project at Great Meadows. We're buying them from New Jersey. We're buying them from Massachusetts. Um, so the idea is to um, provide youth employment and maybe develop a, a local source of, of salt marsh plants as well. We're also going to be working with the Nature Center to um, offer teacher trainings uh, for teachers from uh, state identified um, environmental justice communities and then offer field trips for their students to either come to Hammond Asset um, and learn about the salt marshes at Hammond Asset or um, have an educator from the Nature Center go to um, their school to teach them about uh, salt marshes. And then we're also going to be offering some salt marsh days um, next summer at Hammond Asset where um, people can just come and learn about the values of our salt marshes, the threats that they face, and um, sort of what are some of the ways or strategies that um, uh, working with lots of partners, we can hopefully uh, make a difference for our salt marshes. So um, that is the, the project that we literally just got some funding for. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a beach nesting birds in it, but the sort of idea is to make the marshes at Hammond Asset um, as really resilient in the pos as possible in the, if, in the sort of with, with sort of sea level rise and increased frequency of storms in the years ahead. Did I miss anything, Dennis? Uh, no, uh, except that uh, the living shoreline um, could also provide um, habitat for uh, piping plovers and uh, oyster catchers to nest there. That is that is definitely a part of it. Um, so one thing we're we're looking into, and this no. is very like we got to see what how what happens, but um. You know, one thing is Army Corps of Engineers has to dredge harbors periodically, and um, Clinton Harbor is going to be up for dredging um, a few years down the line. And one thought is that if we were to sort of develop some sort of living shoreline, we might be able to take some of this dredge material from Clinton Harbor um, and sort of put it in the area where the salt marsh has eroded and, um, you know, could be beach nesting bird habitat for a period of time. We'd like to sort of see the marsh that was lost um, sort of... Um, um, recreated isn't the right word restored restored is the word i'm looking for um but the, uh, there, were, there were those birds nesting along there 15 years there ago. were yeah yeah so the road that is not many because it's not a huge area but it is it, it was, was one fairly... of the most productive i think right like, just like five six years ago that um, naturally preserve a ham and asset. One year, it was the most productive nesting area in the state of Connecticut. Um, that was that was not that long ago. Um, yeah. But the the beach that is there now um, is is so much lower in elevation that pretty much that entire area gets washed over um, when there's a storm event at this point. So, um, but I agree that would be that is sort of one of the goals is to sort of try to restore not just the marsh but also try to restore some of that um, coastal nesting bird habitat as well. Anyone else have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Patty, go ahead. How do you uh, catch the birds to ban them and not get them all stressed out? So, uh, I mean, I'm sure that there's some amount of, of stress. I think that, that no stress is completely unavoidable, but um, 
but it is quick. Um, so what we do, we have two ways that we catch the oyster catchers. Um, one of them is we call we use something called a noose carpet, and it, it is literally just a, a one by one meter mat that has some um, so loops on it, and then we we basically set up decoys near it, and we play oyster catcher sort of territorial sounds, and the the oyster catchers that are nesting on site come in to sort of check it out. They get their feet caught in the netting, um, and then um, my my head oyster catcher coordinator, Beth, runs in very fast and gets the bird out of the netting, bans it. Um, and in about, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, it's, it's on its way again. Um, the other thing that we use is called a wish net. Um, and we used to use this more. We don't use it as much anymore. And the reason we don't use it as much anymore is it only works when you have a sandy beach. Um, and a lot of our oyster catchers are nesting in rocky areas. So it's, that's why we kind of have switched to the, the noose carpet. But the wish net, um, Basically how it works is it's bungee powered um, and it's sort of the net kind of is sort of put back, you know, kind of held back. And then you have same thing, put out a decoy, play some sounds. When the birds come in to the decoy, you sort of pull the cord. The net goes whoosh um, over the birds. You run out, grab the birds, get them out of the net. And again, in about five, 10 minutes, they're banded and released. All right. Good question, Patty. Thank you. Uh, one more question about the uh, lifespan of these birds. Uh, how it's a... Oyster catchers live the longest, I'm sure, but do we have uh, an idea of how long uh, piping plovers live? I think um, the the... Previously, we thought plovers lived five, seven, eight years, um, but uh, Pink Flag 2E is a bird that was behanded in the Bahamas um, quite a few years ago now and has come back to Sandy Point to nest yet again. Um, and she is eight or nine years old at this point. So, um, you know, that's an, just an, one example. Um, but, um, you know, I think there's some consensus that we used to think plovers yeah, lived five to seven years, but now we're realizing that they do live a little bit longer than that. Um, oyster catchers, um, I think that oyster catchers are probably something around, somewhere around the 15 to 20 year range. Um, uh, for piping plovers, we sort of strive for a, a 1.5 fledglings per pair productivity. Um, and then for oyster catchers, we sort of strive for a 0.6 fledglings per pair productivity. And the reason that that uh, productivity rate is so much lower than the plovers is because of the oyster catcher's long lifespan. Um, you know, so, and, you know, maybe if a, a pair isn't successful one year, but they're successful the next year, and then maybe not the next year, but then they are the next two years, um, they have a high chance of, of replacing themselves and growing the population um, with a relatively, with a lower productivity rate um, versus the plovers are, you know, a little bit shorter lived than the oyster catchers. So their productivity rate that's required to sustain the population is higher. And do, do you know what the survival rate is for uh, fledged birds? How many, how many, what percent return the following year? I'm gonna say, I would, I don't know that off the top of my head. And to give us a few more years and we'll be able to give you some some survival statistics for oyster catchers. But um, we kind of um, 2020 was when we first first started banning oyster catcher chicks um, for banning oyster catcher chicks. Um, you know, you, I will admit you do kind of just chase them down and grab them. Um, there's no you don't put them in nets or anything like that um, you, there. You know, you kind of wait until they're, you know, um, old enough that their legs are the right size to put the bands on them. And then um, but they aren't able to fly yet. And so it, they just kind of chase them down and grab them, put the bands on them. Um, uh, but we should, we banded quite a lot more of oyster catcher chicks last year. So I would say in a few years, we should have a bet, a good sense of what the sort of survival rates are for oyster catchers in Connecticut. Last call. But, for uh, I would say the fact that those two chicks from 2020 are back and now breeding in Connecticut. Um, you know, I think, uh, that, that's a good sign to me, you know, if it sort of makes me think that if a, if, if a pair is able to fledge their chicks, at least when we're talking about oyster catchers, um, that those, those chicks have a pretty good chance of surviving, um, you know, um, going forward. So 
the oyster catchers, they do spend, a, you know, it's not just the, the month that they're raging, they're, you know, getting their chicks to the point of fledging. They do continue to stay with their chicks, um, you know, for a few to several months, even up to a year afterwards. So the sort of parental care provided by oyster catchers is, is pretty high, which might be um, sort of related to the survival ship. All right, Corey, thank you so much. That was very informative and uh, appreciate